Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, today's session is in regards to the Public Pre-K Technical Assistance Series. I believe this is our fourth Thursday, if I'm correct, third or fourth. Um, I'm Nicole Madour. I'm the Early Childhood Specialist on the Early Learning Team at the Department of Education, and I have some colleagues here today. Marcy, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, my name is Marcy Whitcomb. I am the public pre-K consultant on the early learning team, and I will hand it to Sue. Hi, my name is Sue Galant. I'm the pre-K expansion consultant. I provide technical assistance to the MJRP grants. I'm part of the early learning team as well. Great. And other members of our team are listed here. We have Leanne Larson. She's our director. Stacey McCoy is our Head Start State Collaboration Director, and Jane Kersling works to oversee our um, the pre-K expansion grants uh, under the MJRP funding as well. So um, all of us are here and ready to offer any assistance, uh, but for today's purposes, Marcy and Sue and I will uh, lead us through some slides. Our topics of discussion are going to be curriculum and assessment review, as well as high quality classroom environments and materials. So as folks are um, starting to think about their expansion classrooms or their startup classrooms, um, trying to set you up, up on the right foot and deciding uh, curricula choices, assessment choices, and then of course classroom um, materials and furniture that will set all of your students and your teachers up for success in the next school year. All right, so I'm going to kick us off with a little bit of some uh, more information around curriculum and assessment. As always, some things are required, some things are recommended, so we'll be sure to highlight the difference um, as needed. We always refer back to Chapter 124, which is our public pre-K program standards. Section 4 is, of that rule is where curriculum uh, comes up originally. So we it talks there about the school administrative units. Um, this is sort of uh, the rule language, that they shall inform parents and students of the curriculum, the instructional expectations, and the assessment system. And preschool programs must demonstrate curriculum practice that aligns with our early learning and development standards. So those are our MELDs. So similar to the K-12 learning standards, our main learning results, the public pre-K uh, utilizes our MELDs as the learning standards. Um, and that really is meant to cover all children from ages three to five in the private and public realm of care and education. Um, so all curriculum should align to those. I will add also that these are currently being reviewed for any updates and edits necessary. The current version is from 2015, so still very relevant. Um, definitely something that is available for folks. We have it available online as a PDF. We also have a number of um, printed booklets available, but I did just want to add the caveat that an updated version will become available um, over the next few months. So um, just sort of keep that in mind as you're as you're thinking about your pre-K program. Uh, also, teachers must organize their space and select materials in all content and developmental areas. So our MELS does cover more specific domains than the main learning results. Um, or it, with that too, they're sort of more spread out. So we have everything from social emotional development down to social studies and everything and everywhere in between. So we're wanting to make sure that all of our public pre-K classrooms are reflective of all of those domains of learning, not just uh, math standards, not just ELA standards, but the whole child's development. So we've mentioned the guidebook before. We actually um, discussed it more in depth during one of our TA sessions. But our guidebook is really where we start to flesh out some more of the recommendations. In Maine, uh, our Department of Education does not dictate any curriculum or assessment tools specifically. That's a decision that's made locally. Um, so there are common and high quality options available. Um, and so that's sort of where our guidebook and our team on the early learning team comes into play to sort of provide more information and be thought partners to help districts really choose the curriculum and or assessment tool that's going to be best for your community and of students. Um, but ultimately, the decision is yours to make. So the guidebook does uh, describe a little bit more around curriculum um, as a written document that includes learning expectations for all children, uh, it also 
reflects continuous sequential and intentional instruction, again, aligned with the mounds. And towards the end of the guidebook, we uh, have links and appendices available for folks to help them in making the decision around choosing curriculum. So we do ask or require, I should say, we do require that any curriculum that's chosen is evidence-based. So ultimately all that means is that it demonstrates a st st statistically significant effect on improving student outcomes or other relevant outcomes based on at least one of the following criteria. And you can see those there. So there should be strong evidence from at least one well-designed, well-implemented experimental study or moderate evidence from at least one well-designed and well-implemented quasi-experimental study or promising evidence from at least one well-designed and well-implemented correlational study with statistical controls, et cetera. Um, in addition to that definition, the uh, definition of evidence base it also means that it demonstrates a rationale based on high quality research findings. So ultimately what we're trying to uh, express here is that it's not something that teachers are just expected to create on their own and implement on their own, right? We're really wanting to make sure that in our high quality public pre-K classrooms, instruction is provided that has been um, studied in the past, that has research outcomes so that we know that there's um, evidence and there's um, training and uh, research that has been conducted to show that implementing a specific tool uh, gives you the outcomes that you're looking for in terms of student growth and development. Another thing that we uh, mention a lot and actually our, our most current version of the uh, early learning newsletter that just went out talks, there's an article in there that talks about vertical alignment. So we really try to encourage districts to look at what's happening in other grades surrounding pre-K. So specifically kindergarten, but certainly if you're looking for curriculum choices in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, et cetera, to look at what's happening before and after those grades as well, and do our best to align instructional programs to that. So uh, we talk about horizontal alignment and vertical alignment. Vertical alignment is alignment among the grades. Horizontal alignment is what's happening across like grades. So all pre-K classrooms or all kindergarten classrooms. Um, so this is something that we can certainly help with um, in the decision-making process and sort of break down uh, what's happening across the school and across the district and other grades and, and what tools are available that might best align to those already happening. And we really strive and encourage districts to be mindful of selecting too many curricula. Um, there's a lot of options that exist out there and some in and of themselves do address all domains of learning for a preschool age student, but some don't. Some are specifically meant to teach math concepts or specifically intended to teach writing and reading concepts. So with that in mind, it's possible, and it happens all the time, that districts are choosing multiple curriculum tools to utilize in the classroom. And so now you're getting um, a, a plethora of materials, much more added um, expectation as far as the teacher's instructional uh, duties, um, potentially more training and coaching that can get confusing and be difficult to schedule. So just be mindful of what curricula you're choosing. Um, a lot of our pre-K programs still operate on a half-day schedule. So trying to cram all of these different tools into a part-day program can be incredibly stressful on the part of the teacher. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, be mindful of in looking at tools that are whole child-based and do uh, provide instruction hopefully in an interdisciplinary way to the child that meets all domains of learning. So some quick resources that we have available, these are on our website and in the guidebook and we can always um, add them uh, in an email or perhaps in the chat, but there is a guide that the um, Head, National Head Start puts out, it's called the Curriculum Consumer Report. This is a really great tool to compare different curriculum choices. Um, they have a rubric that they use to sort of assess what each tool offers to a program. So it's a really great way to sort of get a visual layout of um, what exists. 
um, the cost, what the specific tool addresses in terms of uh, instruction. So th this is definitely one that I offer to districts um, often. Oops, sorry about that. Hold on. Another one is a social emotional curriculum consumer report. So same idea, except it's only reviewing curricula that addresses social emotional learning. Um, it's not uncommon for curricula that you see in the first consumer report, the curriculum consumer report, to address the academic domains of learning. Um, and schools often are looking to supplement instruction with specific social emotional tools. So uh, this tool does exist for that purpose too. Uh, our main department of education has worked over the last few years to create and pilot and provide training for pre-K for me. So this is our own homegrown, um, well-loved option. Uh, it's free to access. It's completely digital on our website. And it was created in partnership with Boston Public Schools. Um, they have what they call focus on early learning, and that's what they use in their city. So we adapted their tool to be more relevant for students and the experiences of our students and families here in Maine. So that's pre-K for me. We also have um, K for me, which is meant for kindergarten classrooms. And this year we are just finishing piloting first grade for me. So when we talk about earlier that vertical alignment, right? So some schools are starting to latch onto that concept and implement pre-K for me for pre-K, K for me in kindergarten and first grade for me in first grade, completely optional. You will find pre-K for me in the curriculum consumer report. Uh, we worked with an agency to have that added. So that's another great talking point. And if you're curious on the um, where that was developed from, you could access the Boston Public Schools at this link here. Um, they call their uh, kindergarten program K-1 and they call their preschool program KO. Actually, I think KO is three-year-olds. K1 is, anyways, they don't call it pre-K. <laughs> then uh, the entire uh, project is focused on early learning. So that's what they call it there. So I'll leave these up for just a second in case folks need to jot anything down. And I did put those in the chat as well. Awesome. Thank you, Sue. So lots of choices, lots of things to consider. Um, we definitely want to be thought partners as much as possible through this process for folks that are just starting new or considering um, transitioning to something new, uh, because there is there's there's a ton to think about. There's a ton to keep in mind. So uh, any way that we can make that easier for you, we want to. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm going to um, pass it over to Sue to talk a little bit about some of the assessment expectations. Sure. So much like curriculum, the DOE does not mandate a specific assessment tool, but we do um, have some guidelines that we have requirements and others that we are looking for folks to follow. I'm sorry, Marcy, did that not go through out of the chat? There it is. There you go. Okay. I didn't know if I was the only one not seeing it, but I didn't want to pause. Yeah. Here we go. So again, going back to section four of chapter 124, they're looking, we are looking for programs to provide periodic and ongoing research-based assessment. Just as the curriculum's research-based, we're looking for the assessment to be research-based as well of learning and the children's learning and development. And I think it's really interesting as we go through the bullet points to note that in the first bullet point, they're asking for the assessment system to document children's interests, needs, and progress. This is so that it can be formative and help inform instruction and help teachers plan. Um, and also looking on, looking mostly for authentic activities, that data to be collected through things the kids are already doing. It should include work samples, observations, anecdotal notes, checklists and inventories that you may be doing, parent conference notes, as well as photographs, videos, and your health information coming from your school nurses. Um, so really looking for a robust collection of evidence. It should communicate with pa parents regularly, families regularly, to ensure a connection between home and school. And there are many systems out there that provide, collect a digital portfolio, which we'll talk about in a minute, with that parents have instant access to, which is really beneficial. And it should align with our early learning and development standards and be used to inform curriculum and instruction. 
We also really wanna make sure that both our curriculum and our assessment tools are informed by family culture, that they are inclusive and children's experience, their disabilities, if there are any, if they need to use communication tools or other tools to communicate around um, completing assessments and then also home language. We also would like to see the tool user required in 124 that it is used in a familiar setting to the children. We wanna capture their strengths and we know that we can do that when they feel most comfortable. And then we also wanna make sure it's informing activities that support planning as well as individualization. And there are some of the tools that lend themselves very nicely to individualizing for children who may not be on the same level, but certainly that data is something that teachers need so that they can plan for individual children. The pre-K guidebook goes further into the expectations and helps clarify some pieces. So again, it highlights that we need to use research-based assessment tools, um, that the teachers and the educational staff are being informed of the students' growth over time, and they're given that information that they need for planning activities to individualize. Quality assessment tools and practices include all of those pieces we talked about before, observation, work samples, anecdotal notes, photographs, even videos. And those can be collected either in a digital or a, a tangible um, portfolio. The assessment tools that SAUs use need to be aligned to the mouths and cover all of those domains, just as the curriculum. So our curriculum and our assessment are going to go hand in hand. And then assessment should be completed across the year at designated times so that they'll have you know, reporting periods, just like in the older grades, but so that they're collecting data across the year. We hope that those observations will be ongoing and happening in the moment, not so much that on-demand testing at two or three points during the year because kiddos learn best and we can capture information best when we look at what they're doing. We do give some information about three different assessment systems that are created and available. The Teaching Strategies Gold, which is used by um, many programs. And if you're in collaboration with a Head Start classroom, they may be already using one of these. And so that's an important piece to talk with your partner agency about. Um, Teaching Strategies Gold um, also has a curriculum component that goes with it. So that's an, a piece that can be looked at as well, as does Core Advantage which goes along with the high scope curriculum and then the work sampling system. And these um, links are here. And Nicole, do we still have a state license for teaching strategies that gives us a little bit of a discount on that? Yes, you read my mind. Um, <clears throat> we do have a statewide license with teaching strategies for use of the gold assessment. Um, so that provides a student platform license to the district at a reduced per student cost. So definitely something to be um, thoughtful of when making a decision. If you choose to go with gold, let us know because we can definitely get you a reduced cost. Yeah, and again, these are platforms that have indicators that are aligned to the mouths. They also are a digital portfolio system and have um, parent communication systems built into them as well. That um, some teachers find very beneficial. Right. And I think, I'm um, sorry, so not to interrupt. I'm pretty sure that there's an assessment curriculum consumer, or no, I said that wrong, an assessment consumer report. At least I thought there was. Um, so I'll have to do some digging and see if I can't share that uh, out. I was just making note of that. So I wanted to let folks know. Thank you. All right. And I'm going to hand it over to Marcy, who's going to talk to you about her favorite thing the preschool classroom environment. Yeah, thank you, Sue. So we're moving into the classroom environment. Um, we're gonna start by talking about how to sort of set a classroom up, what the space looks like, uh, some of the centers and that sort of thing in there, and then we'll go back and talk about materials after. So when you're setting up a classroom, one of the tools that we use and, and offer to teachers is um, to start with the drawing of, your, of the space. So you wanna start with the drawing of the perimeter of your classroom. And after you do that, you wanna take notice of things like uh, things that cannot be removed. What, what's a carpet flooring look like? Obviously that cannot be removed, but keep in mind, you know, is it all floor, is it all carpet? Is it all tile? How are they, how are they proportioned? 
um, is the lighting natural? Where are the doors and windows located? Um, are the lights dimmable or are they all one brightness? Um, you wanna obviously lay out where the sinks and bathrooms and where your water source is. And then your cubby spaces, if they're in the classroom, if they're outside the classroom, where we don't necessarily need to consider those. <clears throat> they should be near the classroom door though for um, convenience of the children. But if they're outside the classroom, we don't need to consider those at this point. So we're going to start by looking at our non-negotiable centers and our centers are our uh, learning areas in the classroom, activity areas. So we'll start by making a list and I think we actually have a list of our non-negotiable centers. Um, sometimes, sometimes this will be specific to the curriculum that you choose. Uh, <clears throat> there's a block center for up to four to five students, a dramatic play center for three to four children, Manipulatives and fine motor materials, uh, usually at a table or an open carpet space for three to four children. Library reading area, three to four children. And a writing table for up to four children. Um, we we'll also add in an art, an art station, an easel, and a discovery or texture table, such as a sand and water table. Um, oh, and just a <laughs> quiet space. <seat. laughs> Clearly, I'm not manipulating the slides. Um, and then a quiet space. So I wanna start by talking about, oops, can you go back real quick? Just real quick, um, the reason that we have the number of children who generally are allowed in one center is A, because if you limit that, you're gonna have less um, chaos in the classroom. So that's positive, but also that helps you re understand how number of materials and quantity of materials you need in that space. So if you have a table, for manipulatives for three or four children, you want to have, you know, maybe four to five different manipulative activities, one for each child, maybe one for them to share, something like that. If you fill your shelves, it's overwhelming to make a choice as a four-year-old. It's also um, overwhelming to clean up as a four-year-old and a teacher, um, and it's just not conducive to three to four children. Um, and also, I want to just mention the quiet space real quick. Quiet space is a space where a child can go to sort of regulate themselves if they need that. Sometimes classrooms are loud, lights are bright, there may be background noise, it can be chaotic. Um, sometimes children need a space, a safe space where they can be seen by teachers to go and sort of just be by themselves. Maybe there are books in there, maybe a soft pillow, just to sort of, um, you know, regulate their emotions, regulate their bodies, and, and sort of it, it also leads for good interactions with teachers around why they need that space. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, after you look at these spaces, after you draw out your classroom, you're going to look at the following two centers as space allows. This isn't; These are not necessarily non-negotiables. They're great to have in a classroom. We don't always have the space. So a science center, it's easily accommodated along a low shelf or window, like a window sill, um, allowing students to observe the outdoors as well as items indoors. And then a technology center, which may have a computer, may have iPads, um, technology, sort of things like that. So this doesn't mean that science and technology materials should not be included in other centers. Um, a lot of times we try to incorporate math and literacy in the dramatic play area. We incorporate you know, science and technology in the block area. Um, so often teachers will combine these manipulatives and these activities into one center. And then in addition to those specific centers, you're going to want to consider these additional spaces. You're going to want to consider a space for teacher, like a teacher space for um, a teacher space for personal belongings, also a student space, a cubby space for students and their belongings, storage for materials that are not in use inside or outside of the classroom, display boards, where are they positioned? Are they too high? If they're, if they're too high, they're going to be outside the child, child's eye range. And if they're too low, they may be just in the way or um, knocked about that sort of thing. You'll wanna have a whole group space that accommodates up to 16 children and two adults comfortably. And then a small group space or two that um, is a space for one adult and four to eight children. So furniture and materials in the classroom. It's really good to start with making an inventory of what you have, seeing how that works, and then maybe making a list of what you may need to sort of fill in there. So the inventory that we have, um, just an example here, <clears throat> or things that you would want to look for, would be tables for student use. So you'll need tables for meals, small group, and tabletop activities. Keep in mind that your art table can also double as a lunch table. 
and your small group area can happen at the lunch tables, can happen at the manipulative table and the art table when we clean up and go to a different area of the day, time of the day. Shelving that's accessible by students. We want materials that are out to be accessible, easily accessible, so students can independently get materials off the shelves by themselves. A drying rack for art projects, an easel, <clears throat> kitchen and dramatic playset, a texture discovery table. Again, that's generally your sand and water table. Um, sometimes you may have other things in there, but sand and water table is what they're generally called. Whole group display message easel. That would just be um, an easel with maybe a whiteboard with some shelves or bins underneath it at the whole group time, just so when you're doing whole group activities, you can easily have your materials ready to go. You don't have to spend a lot of time getting up and down to get them. They're all right there. Plus you have the whiteboard to help you with your activities. Um, adult furniture in the classroom is important because research has showed us, shown us that if adults are sitting in a comfortable adult uh, shaped furniture, size furniture, they're more apt to um, engage for longer and have stronger interactions with children. And those activities will run longer. Um, adult furniture doesn't necessarily have to be a chair, but they do have um, adult size like floor chairs and other, um, I don't know exactly what they're called, but they do have other things that aren't just like regular chairs. And then materials that depict diversity and nature, those could be actual um, items from nature. Diversity could be in images on the wall, it could be in books, it could be in um, different materials, um, in dramatic play or block area or any area for that matter. And then materials from nature again could be, uh, again, posters, they could be actual materials from nature that children can manipulate and explore. So next you're gonna categorize your centers. You're gonna look at your block center, your dramatic play, manipulatives, library, writing, art, texture table, quiet space. You're gonna categorize those. So generally your writing area and your library would be on the quiet side. Noisy would probably be blocks and I'm gonna guess dramatic play sometimes. Dirty wet is generally your texture table and your art table or easel. And then a quiet, another quiet also would be your quiet space, obviously. So when you're looking at those, you're gonna use the perimeter that you drew out <clears throat> and sort of highlight your messy zones, your active zones, they have an entry zone on this one, your quiet zone. Um, and then also think about your whole group space and where, how children are facing. And that may be something that you, maybe something that after you get set up and have been in a couple of large groups, you may look at changing the direction of the children, how they're facing, mainly because if they're facing the door and people are coming in and out, that can be really distracting. Um, if they're also facing a window and it's, you know, other children are outside playing, that can be really distracting. So just things to sort of think about. <clears throat> and then you're gonna take your centers that you listed and you're gonna look at the categories that you put them in and how you laid out your floor and you're gonna fill them in. Um, and so you can see here, they have the tabletop toys in the house corner, which is dramatic play in this one. Um, dramatic play is next to the block area. You have your sand in your water table and the art table next to the sink and the cooking area. Um, the computer area, library, listening center, there's a little loan space in there. That's all in one area as well. So you can see they're kind of grouped together by the categories that we looked at. And then it's also important to remember to designate your space. Using furniture and equipment to your advantage is a really powerful thing in a pre-K classroom. Um, if you avoid putting your furniture around the perimeter as I might do in my living room, um, you're gonna, if you put furniture as, as a picture, you, you see that you've broken up the room, you've broken up the spaces. So your furniture is actually designating those spaces. Um, if those shelves were not there, that would be pretty much a runway. And we all know what happens with four-year-olds in wide open spaces, whether it's circle or back and forth or you know that sort of thing. So really think about how the children may see the space and how the children may use the space when you're setting it up. Um, and you also can really, you can really make your centers a little like more full and definitely, um, I can't think of the word that I want, uh, the boundaries, their boundaries to each center. That helps you keep materials in the center, helps keep play in the center and that sort of thing too, um, naturally. Yeah, and I would just add super quick, Marcy, that this picture here is of a kindergarten classroom in Boston. Um, some of our uh, folks from the Department of Education 
visited their one of their schools um, to see their instructional program in action. Um, and one of the big takeaways that our team had was how those teachers really used their space and the environment to be an added educator in the room. Um, so teachers were really available to interact with students in a much more productive way because their environment set them up for that success to begin with. Um, so I didn't want you to think that this photo was just of a really beautiful classroom that exists. It is, but it's a very beautiful classroom that exists locally and one that our um, colleagues have visited and brought a lot of information back from. So also to highlight that we're talking about pre-K classrooms, but arguably all of these ideas and um, things that we are saying you should be considerate of trickle up into the other early grades as well. Um, so this is a kindergarten classroom and it was just lovely. But sorry, Marcy, that's, to interrupt. No, that's okay. I was just gonna say thank you for mentioning the room setup and how you do your, your boundaries and designate your space as the third educator in a classroom. That's something that I've always said and I don't even understand how I forgot to say it, but it's such an important one because when you are doing that, you really have a space where Kids cannot run. They can't, you know, they're so it really does help. <clears throat> okay. And the next thing is to avoid clutter, um, which can be hard in small areas or when you don't have a lot of storage. But it is important to understand that when rooms are cluttered or even walls are cluttered, if your display walls have too much on them, it can be really over like a lot of input overwhelming to children. It can make the room chaotic. Um, it can just make everything seem a little bit more busy, which sometimes is can set the kids up to be a little more busy and loud. So we're gonna look at storing unused items up and away from students, preferably in colored tubs or boxes that are not see-through so students cannot see what's in them because when they do, they say, can we get that down? Can we get that down? Can we play with that today? And um, it's kind of works against your intentionality. If this is impossible, store unused, unused items on low shelves covered with plain curtains or sheets to minimize distractions. Another uh, visual, if they're on a low shelf covered with a sheet, is a just a visual little stop sign that you can put there. Um, and then walk the kids through, this is what the stop sign means, this is a center, this is an area that's not open, this is a teacher area, that sort of thing. Um, be mindful of wall displays. I think I just said that, but I will reiterate because I didn't read down the slide. Um, so is the content that's on the walls applicable to the curriculum, too bright, too dull, is it student created? Um, I just want to talk about the student created real quick when we're looking at environments, because when we are putting up student artwork or pictures of themselves or pictures of them and their families or their homes or their pets or their writing and dictation, those sort of things, uh, children really, um, they really take ownership of that. They, they're prideful. It really can motivate them in the classroom to continue to work on those projects or motivate other children to want to do projects that maybe they didn't do originally when they see others work. So that's really, really important. Um, it helps them to really to sort of see themselves in the classroom a little bit more. Um, alphabet posters, again, are they too high? Are they too cartoony? Are they too low? Are they damaged? Anything that's too high or too low is going to be overlooked by, by a four or five year old. They're not going to look up to see something and they're not going to necessarily look down either. Um, and so one of Nicole's favorite things is the hip video test. Um, and this is what we talk to teachers about doing when you set up your classroom, take your phone, a, a little you know, video recorder, your phone works really well and hold it on your hip or get on your hands and knees that can work too, or get on, on your knees, I guess, and walk around the room. And then when you watch it, you can see that level is what the children are gonna see. So if they're, if they're not seeing the number, the number charts that are way up at the top of the ceiling, or if you're not seeing that in your video, they're not gonna see that. Or if you're seeing like, whoa, that really bright picture that I put right there is like right in your face when you walk that way, then that's what they're gonna see. So it's a really good sort of test to see um, how you've done on all of the clutter and overwhelming chaotic things. <laughs> That is my favorite test. You're right, Marcy. <laughs> um, I think it's just a great way to sort of self-reflect on what you think you've created as a really wonderful space for young children. Might look amazing from a five foot plus level, um, but our young children are, are not that tall, right? So they're much shorter and they're uh, experiencing the classroom from a much different height, <laughs> like just a, 
is fact. Um, so getting their perspective through a video um, can be hugely helpful in designing and, and organizing materials in a space. So yeah, that is my favorite. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to take it from here and just sort of uh, look at the centers on a one by one sort of basis. Um, like Marcy said, depending on what curriculum or instructional program you choose, it's going to come with really specific centers and specific materials. Um, but generally speaking, any high quality early childhood classroom is going to have many similarities in terms of their centers. So this is just sort of our way of pointing out what we've seen in our uh, experience in Maine and our experience as educators to be of high quality um, organization, it's quality materials, you name it, um, and just wanted to share a few sort of highlights of those. So the Block Center is hugely important for young children's um, development in a pre-K classroom for a variety of reasons. It's really an interdisciplinary way of um, instructing students to work with each other, to persist in their um, trial and error of building, their fine motor um, strengths and, and stacking, patterning, um, different science, and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it. Um, it'll come to me and I'll, I'll say it. Um, but anyway, having this space available for young students is in my opinion, a no-brainer and a non-negotiable. Um, we want to make sure that we're offering students high-quality materials, so we always recommend um, the wooden unit blocks. These are stand the test of time, um, and they, over time and as budget allows, you can really add to this collection. Uh, I was at a school once where uh, the pre-K classroom didn't have wooden blocks yet, so we were talking about ways that we could uh, acquire that for this specific space. And the administrator said, I think we have a bunch of those down in the basement in storage from years ago. And the teacher and I were like, go get them, <laughs> go get them right now. Um, so don't underestimate what you might have tucked away in storage from years past. Um, they don't have to be bright and shiny and brand new. Our students aren't worried about that. They need to be functional um, and they need to serve a purpose in the space. So here in this picture, you can see that they are using wooden unit blocks. They're organized on an open shelf by shape. Um, you can see the arrows are pointing to labels on those shelves. This helps students in the cleanup and organization process. Uh, we always recommend that these materials are introduced over time. So unit block collections come in like 120 plus blocks. Don't put all of those out on day one. <laughs> um, introduce them over time. So put out a few rectangles, a few squares, a few bridges, um, a few semicircles. And as students learn the expected behaviors in that space and learn how to care for their classroom materials and organize and clean them up at the end of the center time, then you can start to add more and increase with the collection. Um, but we But we never recommend putting them all out there on day one. Also in the block center, it's not uncommon to see other materials. Um, these are typically specific to the curriculum. So you'll see here they have road signs. Um, there's We always love to see books added for inspiration for students to build with. Um, sometimes there's other, you know, cars or things with wheels or other added um, props so that students can add to their building structures as well. So, uh, you know, pre-teach what, what's expected here, uh, how high can a structure be, how uh, wide can a structure be. Sometimes these block centers are often on carpeted flooring, uh, which is great for sound for when things come tumbling down, but not always great for stacking and, and having a strong foundation for a structure. So I've seen teachers use uh, pieces of plywood or the tops of their wooden sensory bins to give the students a more solid ground to build on. Um, those things can just sort of be determined over time. Oh, I will say too, uh, often, this doesn't have to be this way, but often the block center doubles as the whole group space um, because we know that if four or five children are working in the block center, they need space to sort of spread out. Sometimes they're doing building individual structures on their own. Sometimes they're collaborating with each other. So having a nice big space uh, really it, it encourages that type of play. Um, and often the biggest space is also the whole group space for those times too. Doesn't have to be, but an option. 
Another important center uh, that shows up in many of our uh, research-based curriculum is the writing center. So you can see here that the materials, again, they're organized, they're labeled, they're within reach of the students so they can access things independently. Um, there's just a few writing implements, right? That we don't have every single pencil available. We don't have every single crayon in a bucket. We don't have every single pair of scissors that we've ever purchased, just a few. Um, if the writing center is gonna allow for four students at a time, then probably six to eight of each material as far as writing implements goes would be a solid number. Um, keeping in mind that students might access this space throughout the day um, from other centers as well. So we don't wanna be too limiting. Um, you'll see there are interesting materials, colored pencils, um, some of these crayons that are like the rotation type, not just your typical Crayola ones. Um, there may be writing assistance, like things to help students with their grip of a writing utensil. Different forms, sizes, colors of paper. I've seen whiteboards, I've seen chalkboards, you name it. So keeping it interesting, again, rotating materials throughout the course of the school year. Um, the writing center on day one should not look the same as the writing center on the last day of school, right? It's going to change and morph throughout time. We often recommend writing centers to be centrally located in the classroom so that it can be accessed from all different centers throughout the day, um, as opposed to being you know, on a perimeter or somewhere that students have to walk across the entire room to access. So writing center is a common one that students, whether they're in dramatic play or in blocks or at the art easel, um, they often wanna access something from there. So keeping it centrally located helps with, with that. Dramatic play, one of my favorites. <laughs> so this is really a great space to support imagination. That was the word I was looking for earlier, imagination, um, and student interaction. It offers uh, a multitude of ways for role-playing scenarios um, and themes likely are going to shift and materials will shift with that again throughout the year. So the beginning of the school year, it might be set up like this to have a kitchen, maybe some baby dolls set up like a home. As the year progresses and themes of study progress, you might see this become a veterinarian's office or a post office or a grocery store or a flower shop or an ice cream shop, right? So just having the flexibility and the materials ready to swap this out as needed. Um, I have had classrooms in the past say, you know, I, I want to create a, a post office in my classroom, but I have a group of students that are just really stuck on the kitchen home setup. Um, and I just don't dare take that away. Okay, well, maybe your space has um, space available to offer both, right? There's no one saying that you can't have a kitchen set up and a post office set up. Um, so, you know, don't uh, think that the answer has to be, nope, we've got to swap this all out. You know, we, we're certainly uh, available to help think of ways to include both. The art center typically has an easel where at least two students, if not more, can stand and create their art, as well as a tabletop um, for the options uh, and for students who prefer that method of art. Um, there, this is typically an area where there are lots of visuals for inspiration, in addition to books, perhaps. Um, hopefully there's a drying rack available. I've seen some really creative drying racks. You don't have to spend money on ones that come from, um, you know, store-bought places. It, it can certainly be creative with string um, and clothespins and what have you. And typically, hopefully, classrooms have a display in the classroom or in the hallway for the art that students create. So I want to, want to be sure to celebrate their, their creativity. Again, materials change and shift and are added throughout the year. Sensory tables, um, these are often placed on tile or have some type of, of tarp or placemat underneath so that when it gets wet or when it gets messy, um, we're protecting carpets. But it is an area to support textile and fine motor development of young students. 
Um, in this space, they really get to be um, experimental with a variety of manipulatives and test hypotheses like sink and float, more or less. Um, we've seen water. We here the students are using rice. Um, I've seen sensory tables set up as ponds. We've used them as composting bins with worms. I mean, really, the options are really endless. Uh, it also offers development in a variety of learning domains. So we see a lot of math content happening here, scientific thinking, physical th um, development, and, as well as social development when students are working among their peers. So don't underestimate the power of a sensory bin. During COVID, uh, teachers got really creative with how to still offer sensory bins without cross-contaminating them. Um, so I've seen this big bin morph into individual smaller bins. So that's definitely an option as well. Um, a math and man manipulative center. This is uh, one that is likely going to offer items to support counting, sorting, patterning, organizing, and turn taking. So there's almost always some type of a game that um, two or three students can use. There's also many activities that can just be used individually if a student just wants to work alone. Um, they hopefully can utilize a table or a floor for these activities. They're organized, again, easy to access, labeled, clear bins, not too overwhelming, easy to clean up. Um, so just keeping those pieces in mind when thinking about math and manipulative centers. I wanted to add real quick something about Thank the you. sensory tables. Um, if you also don't have a space, like if you have a smaller room or you don't have a larger one sensory table, um, what I have done in the past is just get like the sink, like the sink buckets, the rectangle bins and use those and put like four at one table. So you have a table or even on the floor, um, you can also put like a large piece of plastic or a tarp or something of that sort down if you're using water um, on the floor, if you have carpet. So there's there's a, diff a lot of different ways to do that if you don't have the large bin or the room for it. Great. Thanks, Marcy. Um, and then one of our popular quiet areas is the library. Um, so this should be quiet, organized, and welcoming. Uh, should display books with the covers out. You'll notice this particular display of books is not overcrowded. Um, there's plenty of ample space between books so that students can see the full cover and access it ind independently. Uh, it does offer or could offer listening options as well as felt options here you can see. Um, and this is great for story retelling. Um, I know many classrooms that allow students to use iPads in this space as well. Um, and they can either do a game on the iPad or listen to a story and audiobook as well. It's in some really creative QR coding, lots of different scenarios. Again, books change throughout the course of the year um, and, and typically align with the topic of study as well. Offer diversity, language, culture, you name it. Um, there can also be varied seating and comfortable items. So you'll see here some comfortable child side chairs, I've seen bean bags, um, pillows, blankets. Uh, oftentimes there's stuffed animals, things like that. Coming out of the pandemic, I think we're slowly starting to get more comfortable with adding these things back into this type of a space. Um, so definitely uh, recommend that if possible. So last few minute things to be considerate of. So like Marcy said, delineating space throughout the classroom, um, thinking about the teacher's desk, is it necessary? Because remember in chapter 124, we do have a 35 square foot per child requirement in a classroom space. And some of our pre-K classrooms just barely meet that, if they even meet it at all. And things like the teacher's desk, cubby space, door swings, subtract from that square footage. So if you're working with a small space and you're hoping to enroll a full classroom of 16 students, um, then it may not be possible or necessary to have a teacher's desk at all. So keeping that in mind as a possible um, subtraction from the space is an option. Always be cognizant of inclusive classrooms and inviting spaces. Um, some pre-K students do have difficulty maneuvering space um, or have assistive technology to help them access a space. So just being aware of the needs of your students um, and door swings and the space between furniture, things like that. 
an overall understanding and consideration of the atmosphere. Again, is it too bright? Does it feel too clinical? What message is are we sending to visitors? Can you see and hear students in all centers at all times? So during the center time, can adults position themselves in a spot where they can uh, be monitoring and aware of everything that's going on? And is it meant for young children, right? Does it say, hey, I'm a teacher and walking in here, you're gonna know right away the age group that I work with, right? Or does it look like a space for adults? Um, certainly in a pre-K classroom, we want it to be meant for children. So keeping those things as reminders are really helpful. And we do have a really great collection of um, actual photos from main classroom that I believe Sue is going to uh, explain to us. Yep, and I will go through just quickly because I know we're nearing the end. But on the left side, you see examples of two classrooms and they highlight some great things. There are clear sight lines. You can see across these rooms from one end to the other. Um, it also shows how to use the furniture to block off. In the top classroom, it is an open classroom, so an open school. So there are no walls um, between the classrooms. There are only bookshelves. And so you can see that they've used um, curtains to cover those shelves so kiddos don't access. But the bottom shows a nice balance of that empty wall space with displays so that the room isn't overwhelming. Um, on the right-hand side, I just wanted to highlight too, we talked about the block area and the other side of the, the block shelf. This is the back of a block shelf. And in addition to the blocks organized on the other side, you see pencils on the top. And this teacher's creatively used that shelf to display clipboards where the kiddos make plans for their blocks. So anytime we can integrate those writing materials and reading materials in. At the bottom um, on the right side, you also see an example of a rug where there's really clearly delineated spaces for the kiddos. Those kiddos know where their space is and that's an invaluable tool. And really that's an example of the environment as the third teacher because that takes away a lot of the need for teachers to remind kiddos to stay in their own space and do those things. Let me go to the next slide. And these are a number of photos of classrooms. You see centers here, the dramatic play area, a block area. And in this area, they've included recyclable materials because they're building rabbit habitats. Recycled materials make great building materials and kids can really use their creativity and imagination as Nicole brought out. Sensory table. And in this classroom, they also integrated while they're using sand and seashells. They also did a pumpkin exploration this week. And so that pumpkin sat there until they, and they broke it open there and got to explore as well. Um, so sensory doesn't always have to happen just in that table. At the top in the center is an example of a loose part center. In this classroom, there are natural materials, recycled materials, all sorts of things. And this can support math work as well for sorting, patterning and counting. And again, books, help highlight um, what kiddos are doing. One of the things that was highlighted with the science center is that we may not always have a lot of room. And so I wanted to show a couple of examples. The picture in the middle of the basket, this is the science center in one of the classrooms. And this is actually a classroom that does a ton of science, but is a very small classroom. So the basket is probably about this big around. Just, and the teacher puts out a provocation there. Um, several times a week for the kiddos. So here you can see there's a piece of bark and rocks and pine cones, a bowl full of acorns and a magnifying square with the invitation for kiddos to look up close. And on the morning that I took this picture, the kiddos ran immediately to that area when they came in, they wanted to see what was new at the science center. So um, it doesn't take a lot of space to be able to add in a, a quick science center. And at the bottom, you can see a more in-depth science center where this um, classroom is working on plants and the little girl is there. And in addition to science materials, there are writing materials and journals because they are journaling about their observations, things they see. On the, the right-hand side, we see an example of a library and just soft seating and a one-person area. And it's really nice in a classroom to have that balance with all the tables and hard spaces to have the soft spaces where kiddos can also go. In this classroom, they also have some lamps and natural lighting. And really that's because the fluorescent lights can be kind of harsh for some kiddos and cause them to really amp up. 
Um, I like the one person area at the bottom. This is a little pop-up tent. And one of the great things is it's there and in that way, and it's soft. It has a little, I don't know, sheepskin or something in it. But if the kiddos want to turn it around, they can, and the teacher still can peek through the hole. So they can hide, which kiddos sometimes want to do if they're dysregulated, but the teacher still has vision. And the top space up high, that's everything you might want to know if you were subbing in that classroom. You can find it right there, but it's in an interesting nook. All right, and the last slide. And visuals are an important part of our classroom environment. If we want the environment to be that third teacher, visuals really help us. We see an example of classroom rules, which are, are things that really benefit children to have them there. And using photographs really helps kiddos connect with those rules. Again, just you know, four or five rules that kiddos need to follow. Below that, we have a visual schedule. It has the morning and then the afternoon. And those are stock photos, not the children in the class, but they are actual photos that show the kiddos what's going on. Teachers sometimes use the long scheduling pocket charts and that works great too. It's just really helpful for kids to be able to know what's coming next. In our centers, it's helpful for kids to know and focus their attention um, and also know how many kiddos can be there. So there's a couple examples of signs. Um, at the, these two are from the block area. Both show that there are blocks there. They also include the number of children who can be there and a way for them to count, either the blue dots or the um, white Velcro dots, which are also interesting. They, I had assumed when I went into this classroom, it was that they were going to be sticking their names up there and they don't. The kiddos use them, they tactily just touch them and it's another way of counting. And there's also a turns list which is a great idea if you have seven kids who wanna to go to the block area, but you can only send four, then those other three friends' names go on the list. And again, that's a, a instructional move, but it also having the list right there helps the kiddos know what to do. At the bottom, um, there's a visual to help kiddos know what to do when it's cleanup time. And by having these visuals out, the it's accessible for the teacher. So when this teacher gives a direction, she actually picks up that sign. I'm gonna give you a five minute warning when the chime rings again, it will be cleanup time. What will you do? And they go through the expectations. When that happens, when the visuals are there and out, it makes it more easy for that to happen. And then again, that reduces behaviors and other things. On the far side, an example of a calm corner and strategies for kiddos. You have arrival and dismissal routines that are found near the cubbies so that they can go through and work through what steps they need to do. And in the final picture at the bottom right, there's an example of children. It's hard to see here, but they put their photographs on as the faces and colored in their bodies. And so they're represented there in their preschool family. And there are photos of different families around that, which reflect diversity in the, in the community. And even if you're in from a homogeneous, more homogeneous community, it's really beneficial to kids to see that diversity in their classroom. And, and it prompts discussions and it gives an opportunity for discussing the diversity that exists in our culture. And that's part of their social studies work. Thanks, Sue. So as we just wrap up today, oh, we're a minute over. Um, we did want to make everybody aware that we do have a slight schedule change. So the date itself has not changed at all, just the topic that we'll be discussing. So when we meet again on May 25th, uh, now we're going to be discussing child development services and working relationships. And so that has shifted June 8th to focus on student inclusion, social emotional learning and challenging behaviors. And then June 22nd, early childhood teacher training and main roads to quality. So just wanted to make folks aware the dates have not changed, just the topics. Um, and I plan on sending an email as well, just to reiterate this. So if that um, affects your schedule in any way, we apologize uh, for the short notice, um, just based on who we wanted present at these meetings, we had to do a little bit of shifting. So. Thank you for understanding that. And then we're happy to take any questions if there were any. If not, uh, feel free to go and enjoy this gorgeous day. Our contact emails are here. As always, we're available through email um, and telephone call if, if that's the purpose that you're looking to uh, contact us with. 
Um, otherwise, these topics are, are super near and dear to our hearts. So we could go on and on and on about them, as I'm sure you realize today. So uh, definitely let us know any questions um, or areas where we can be more helpful.